All right, I'm showing it is the magic hour. So we'll go ahead and get started and can kind of catch people up as, as they join in here today too. Um, my name is Rachel Anderson and I am the director at the eFactory and we are so excited to have you all join us here today uh, for this awesome webinar. And so I promised my mom I wouldn't be giving tax advice today, but we have an all-star panel for you that will be giving you some tax advice and that will help you answer your questions. Um, we know 2020 was a weird and a difficult year and the theme truly was, you know, business unusual. And so we wanted to put on today's webinar to share information on frequently asked questions that we've been getting uh, when it comes to your 2020 taxes, as well as things to think about as you prepare your 2021 taxes. And we are truly excited to partner with BKD on this webinar. They have been a tremendous partner to our programs, huge supporters of small businesses and startups in our region and really throughout the country. And so you're hearing from the best of the best today. I hope you all have been attending other eFactory and SBDC webinars. If you haven't, um, we have a webinar library that we'll share with you so you can catch up on those. Uh, we have an all-star SBDC consulting team. A few of them are, are on today's webinar that can help answer questions uh, that you may have uh, today. And then you can also meet with them one-on-one -on -one to go through any specific questions that you do have. And so please um, use them, use us as a resource. And so we'll drop these uh, links into the chat. So Paige just put in the webinar library. So if you wanna check any of those out after today's call, we're also recording, and so we'll send you an email after um, today, you know, to to get to be able to get a hold of Jim, Deborah, Crystal, consulting team, uh, to be able to help answer any questions. We're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, you know, please change your Zoom name if you haven't already to your first name and last name, and then that way, if you have a question that we don't get to today, or if you need any additional uh, follow up, our consulting team can reach out to you uh, and can contact you. Please stay muted. So I think you're probably muted when you joined us, um, but please stay muted uh, today and, and use the chat feature uh, to, to answer any questions. We'll go through them in, in real time. We do have a few prepared that we have received, um, but any real time questions at the end, please pop those into the chat feature. Um, and to kind of get things started, we want to already save you some money. And so as a reminder, if you're an eFactory tenant or client, um, you receive a free initial consultation and a 35% discount on your tax um, taxes when you pr prepare those with BKD. And so Jim and Deborah are your point people, uh, and we can give you their contact information so you can reach out to them. And SBDC clients receive a 40% discount on one-year subscription for QuickBooks Online Essentials and Plus. And so that's a great tool um, to help you with bookkeeping as you then work with, you know, Jim and Deborah on, on your taxes. And so, um, you know, make sure you're taking advantage of those and we'll send that information out in the email follow-up too so that you can, um, you know, take advantage of them. Okay, so I think those are our housekeeping items. Let's move on to introductions. Um, so like I said, we have an all-star experts and, and people that I really turn to uh, when I have questions and then also refer client questions. And I'm so excited that you all get to meet them and hear from them today. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about um, who they are, their role, and how they can help you. And Jim, we will get started with you. Rachel, thank you. Great to be with everyone today. I'm not sure I've been called an all-star before. Maybe uh, when I was a kid, I, I imagine myself to be an all-star athlete growing up, but now I'm an all-star accountant, I suppose. So, um, so uh, again, uh, Jim Ashley, I'm a tax director here in our Springfield office. I'm also our national practice leader for our accounting services team. Great to be with you. Uh, we've been on top of PPP for um, and really a lot of all sorts of COVID relief uh, since it all began and really was emerging um, in, in mid-March or so. So hopefully today it's going to be helpful for everybody. Again, glad to be with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. Deborah. Hi, I'm Deborah Horn. I'm a tax manager at BKD. I've been with them for a little over six years and spent the last few years partnering with the eFactory through BKD. And it's great to be on this Zoom presentation, but I sure miss those in-person contacts and hope we can, we can all meet and have, have some of these learning sessions together in person again soon. You know, Jim says he's not an all-star, but I'd say he's probably our team captain when it comes to all of the guidance that has come out in the last year, the relief bills. Um, businesses have been hit really hard. And you know, as CPAs, we hear from our clients and we hear what has been going 
on with them through this year. And Jim has been an absolute leader nationally for our firm as far as getting the guidance out there and helping us um, understand what's going on and help our clients out. Um, so it's great to be here and, and I'm excited to, to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, thank you both. We are, you know, we are so fortunate that we have you in our community and, and BKD's impact. And I'm with you, Deborah. I can't wait to get back to those in-person events. And, um, you know, here uh, in the next few months, you know, we might look at what that looks like in terms of a hybrid. So still a virtual option or when we can safely return to um, some sort of in-person element. So thank you both for all you do. Um, and I know you graciously give your time for office hours as well that uh, anyone can sign up on, on our website. So, so thank you so much. Um, and also, uh, Crystal, I'd, I'd love to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about SBDC. Sure. So, um, so excited to, to be joining this, this amazing panel. Um, my name is Crystal Irons, and I'm the director of the Missouri Small Business Development Center here at Missouri State University, and of course, part of our uh, wonderful eFactory team. Um, there are several of, of our team on the call. And so, um, you know, as you have questions specifically that we can help you with around, you know, idle and, and processes, things like that, um, we've been helping small businesses really throughout the state um, since last March kind of navigate all of these options and disaster relief. Um, but we are definitely here outside of the, the disaster time and, um, you know, just look forward to helping small businesses grow. Um, one of my favorite things to do is assist small businesses with financial management, uh, whether that be implementing accounting processes, uh, talking about, you know, end of year and, and, and tax planning. Um, but I am definitely not the, the certified public accountant. And so love to also really work really closely with our service providers to make sure that we're providing our small businesses with the best advice possible. So um, you know, as, as we can be of service to kind of help you plan and, and what you need to talk about with your accountant, um, get started in, in implementing practices, also, you know, in software and, and getting your finances um, to where you can use them as a decision-making tool. That's what we're here to do. And um, just excited to share some additional information. Awesome. Thanks, Crystal. So I told you it's nice to have friends that understand um, you know, finances and, and taxes. And so that's that's what we're here to do today to, to answer any of those questions for you um, and, and help you uh, prepare your 2020 taxes. So let's um, start off with you know, the question around how to treat COVID-19 funds when it comes to filing 2020 taxes. So um, Jim, take it away. Sure, and this is a question that has come up a lot, especially from the beginning of CARES Act, and that was way back in March. Um, you know, the the first thing that we were pleased to see in the CARES Act was this uh, notification that, um, hey, the, the, this will not be taxable income, because that when you think about loans being forgiven, that's uh, perceived to be uh, income to a company and gets recorded as such on their books and records. And so that appeared to be the intent of Congress. But over the coming couple of months, the IRS then prescribed some regulations and said, well, time out. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. We agree the forgiveness is uh, not taxable income, but there is a rule that's related to uh, expenses incurred with tax exempt income, and those are not deductible. So that was a huge curveball uh, that came from Treasury and IRS a couple months after CARES was approved and, and signed by the president. So uh, for the past few months, we've been doing tax planning with clients saying, listen, I know it, it sounds kind of wild here, but we really need to kind of consider this for tax projections at year end that those expenses that you incurred using PPP funds, those are not deductible. So that was a big shift. And, and we, um, a, a lot of us were actually kind of running two different scenarios there. One of, um, could this get overturned? Because there was a lot of momentum in Congress in Washington, kind of late summer that uh, they wanted to get this corrected and just frankly couldn't get their acts together on it. Uh, we were hopeful that after the election, they would eventually do that. And they did. And so uh, at the end of December, there was a huge 5,500 page plus bill that was passed by Congress and signed by the president that said, listen, the PPP funds that um, you used and incurred expenses on are now deductible to you. So not only is the forgiveness of the PPP tax exempt, but those 
uh, uh, expenses you incurred are certainly deductible. So a huge win for a lot of clients. And I think that was really the overall intention of Congress to begin with, but they had to uh, get the law updated uh, with respect to that. Uh, the EIDL, that is, uh, let, let's draw a little bit of a distinction there. There's a couple different EIDL programs out there. There's the Economic Indu Industry Disaster Loan, Injury Disaster Loan. That is an actual loan that is not forgiven. You work with SBA directly on that. You go through their website, you get a loan. They kind of, you know, when they first started advertising that, and I sat on a webinar, I remember back in March, where they talked about, hey, it's a t up to a $2 million loan. Well, it got oversubscribed. Uh, so they ended up limiting these uh, idle loans to $150,000 as a ceiling. Um, so still a, a nice uh, benefit for uh, businesses out there to, to get funding, but it, it is a loan, okay? That is a separate loan. Now, the CARES Act allowed for this grant or what they called uh, an advance on it uh, of up to $10,000. Um, that was given to people uh, in advance uh, uh, and was per at first, initially, it was supposed to reduce the amount of potential forgiveness of your PPP. So a little bit of interplay between idle and PPP. So up to $10,000 of your PPP was not going to end up being uh, forgiven if you had that $10,000 grant or advance. Um, that also got fixed uh, as of December 28th. So for those businesses that have already gotten forgiven um, loans and still had 10, 000, up to $10,000 still due, uh, the SBA will be working with those lenders to get um, uh, money advanced back and then eventually back in your pockets as well. So that got fixed too. Then the idle in and of itself, the expenses you incur for that are deductible as well. And that was clarified with that uh, legislation passed and signed on December 28th. Awesome, thank you. So let's move on to unemployment. Um, so you know, how do I treat unemployment funds? I received in response to COVID when filing my 2020 taxes. So you know, unemployment took on a whole new meaning in, in 2020. Uh, and then also, you know, what to do if you're, you know, self-employed, um, will I owe taxes on it? Talk us through um, what we need to know here. Sure. Yeah. And, and unemployment was a big part of stimulus all along the way there and really welcome part and to a lot of suffering individuals. And they had those, um, uh, not only the state unemployment, but the additional federal unemployment on top of that, the $600 and $300. And there's been a lot of questions on that. And the IRS has done a, an okay job, I think kind of reminding taxpayers of the rules there. And, um, you know, big, big picture, you need to be aware that you will be issued a 1099 from, um, if you got unemployment from the state of Missouri, that you'll get a 1099 from the state of Missouri. It is taxable to you, okay? You will have to report that income on schedule one of your 1040. Now, the big question, because they, they came up with this uh, new, uh, unemployment program for the self-employed is, do I have to report that as part of my business income? And the short answer is no. Uh, you will still be issued that 1099, but it is reportable on that Schedule 1, which is a different schedule than your business's income, okay? So that is good news because, um, as you may know, um, if you had a profitable business in years past, that not only did you get tax on regular income, you have this thing called self-employment tax. So uh, that, that is welcome news there as well. Awesome. Thank you. We'll, we'll take all the good news we can get, right? You bet. <laughs> okay. So let's talk um, through EIDL funds, advances, um, you know, what this looks like, um, you know, give us some guidance here. Yeah, yeah, and I may have jumped the gun in, in the first uh, slide there, so my apologies on that. But yeah, on, on the EIDL advances, again, distinguishing between what's an actual loan versus what was a grant or an advance, um, I'm, I'm using those interchangeably, those terms there. So it's up to that $10,000, and that, that was um, $1,000 per employee for up to 10 employees that you were entitled to. Um, so, you know, when that first came out, it was, hey, this is taxable income to you, and it reduces your PPP um, forgiveness. But at, at 12, the uh, uh, legislation that was passed and ultimately signed by the president on December 28th 
um, reversed all that and made it a much uh, simpler process where um, even though it's on your books and records as income, it, um, it, it does not have to be taxed to you and you can uh, deduct expenses that you incurred related to it. Okay, awesome. And then, you know, this next one, um, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, EIDL, um, there's also PPP, and then, you know, in our, our community, um, you know, through Greene County and, and City of Springfield, there were also some, you know, forgivable loans or, or grants that went out. Um, talk us through what this looks like for, you know, when it comes time to do taxes. Yeah, so this is a, a bit of a shift here. So anything that wasn't specifically spelled out in the law in terms of the PPP or the IDLE, uh, these kind of local uh, uh, coronavirus re relief funds, if you will, they're generally taxable. And, and you will most likely be getting a 1099 from uh, the, the, the county or city or whomever uh, sent that to you when you were um, eligible for and received it. So um, just just wanting to, uh, you know, make everyone aware of that, that is a distinction that will end up being a 1099 that you will receive, um, and it will be taxable to you upon receipt. Great, thank you. And I, I believe the city of Springfield still has some funds available. Um, there's a blog post both on eFactory and SBDC websites that will, you know, kind of walk you through what you needed to do to apply for that. So something to consider if you live um, here here in our community. And then if you also have any questions about, you know, disaster relief or or any applications that you can apply for, what's best for your business. Uh, you know, definitely book a meeting with a consultant and, and we're here to help and, and talk through um, what that looks like for your business. All right, any updates you wanna give us in terms of depreciation for, for um, 2020 and, and then also looking forward to 2021? Yeah, I, if that's all right, I may shift this question over to Deborah and uh, let her do some speaking for a while. De Deborah, do you mind sharing some depreciation updates with our listeners today? I'd love to. Depreciation is great. <laughs> well, there there was actually, it's kind of funny, they they we had the Tax Cuts and Job as, Jobs Act a few years ago with a major tax reform shift. And there was what was pretty widely considered a mistake. Um, leasehold improvement property, qualified leasehold improvement property was prior to that considered 15 year property and eligible for bonus depreciation. And they forgot some language and it got, it got to where it was pushed out of bonus depreciation being allowed and the life, was, the life wasn't, um, wasn't said to be 15 years. And that created an issue with a lot of things that would have previously been eligible for bonus depreciation no longer being eligible. And even though Congress intended it, um, they weren't able to correct it. They, they just couldn't, couldn't get together and make that correction. So when the CARES Act passed, they decided, okay, this is a great time for us to fix that. And what they did is they, they put a correction in there um, identifying what qualified leasehold improvement property was and making it eligible for bonus depreciation, which has created opportunities to amend tax returns and get um, potentially a, a refund of taxes or a or um, a, you'll, um, you can amend your tax return and carry forward a, a credit or however you, you see it if you wanted to just apply it to the 2020 tax return or you can go back and apply for your refund um, and by taking bonus depreciation on these, on these assets. Um, so it changed prior tax returns, but we use this for a lot of clients as they did, they did want that refund and they were able to get you know, cash in their pocket um, by amending their tax return and taking that accelerated depreciation on leasehold improvement property. Um, nothing else on the CARES Act or the CAA has really affected depreciation lives, but we still have currently 100% bonus depreciation allowable for certain equipment and assets that are under 20 year lives um, through 2023 when that that's when it will start to step down to less than 100% bonus depreciation. So purchases of assets continues to be a great uh, planning tool for businesses uh, to manage their taxable income. Great, thank you. Um, good to know for you know this year, this past year's taxes, and then also as we plan um, over this next year. So let's talk 
tax credits. So, you know, employee retention credits, you know, paid family leave, sick leave credits, R&D credits. I know we'll um, touch on R&D tax credits, you know, here here in a few minutes when we talk about some planning or, or tools that you might think about um, or could take advantage of. But, but talk us through tax credits. Sure. So uh, I think this slide may help uh, explain having a little bit of history and background on uh, how this came about and, and changes related uh, within the last month. So retention credits were credits that were established by the CARES Act. And these were credits that said, hey, we will offer you credits. And it's really through your payroll tax returns that you would obtain these credits uh, for retaining employees. And for 2020, it was uh, it, your, the first $10,000 of uh, wages that were paid to retain employees. You got, uh, you were eligible for a 50% credit up to that $10,000. So in other words, $5,000 per employee. Um, so early on when the bill, when the CARES Act got passed, we were doing a lot of analysis with, um, you know, what, what does it look like with the uh, retention credit? Uh, what, what possibilities are there for, for cash flow and refunds, um, and then also cash flow and refunds for PPP, because um, with the CARES Act, it says you can't get both. You have to choose the PPP or the, the retention credit. So it turns out in, in most cases, not all, but most cases, the PPP was a much better opportunity uh, for clients, and, and so they ended up going down that path. So uh, those that... Um, got the retention credit that didn't get PPP the last few months. Um, you know, they, like I said, they were getting up to a $5,000 credit per employee. The rules get a little more complex when you've got affiliated employers and your total aggregated uh, uh, number of employees is over a hundred, but if it's under a hundred, it's pretty straightforward. Now, what happened in late December? Well, uh, they, they uh, and a little bit unexpected, in fact, a lot unexpected, they retroactively changed the rules for retention credits and said, oh, by the way, now you are eligible even though you got a PPP fund. So you can retroactively go back and look to uh, get potential refunds uh, using the, uh, uh, the method of your uh, 941s, your payroll tax returns, for the retention credit, okay? So that is something that is out there. They also said, uh, you know, th there might be a special rule to kind of catch this up all in fourth quarter and the uh, uh, IRS and treasury would need to publish guidance on that. Unfortunately, we don't have guidance just yet. And I can't say I blame them since that was signed into law December 28th. I can't imagine the IRS trying to get uh, a updated form and, and let alone um, uh, the IRS, but uh, all the software vendors out there that help uh, professionals or clients themselves file those 941s, uh, getting that all done uh, over the next 30 days seemed like a Herculean, if not impossible task because those 941s are due here at the end of this month. So anyway, know that is out there. Know there needs to be guidance coming on that. There's a potential opportunity for retention credits. Um, the two rules for applicability there are, was there a, a full or partial shutdown in your business? Okay, by a govern, uh, governing authority? Uh, or two, was there more than a 50% reduction in your gross receipts for that calendar quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, okay? so. Either one of those triggers, you might be eligible for that retention credit. Uh, certainly be mindful of that. The, uh, and <laughs> uh, the retention credit was also set to expire at the end of December, and it's actually got expanded um, and extended through uh, next half of next year. And we'll talk about that in, in a later slide. But I want to hit real quick on the uh, family leave and sick leave credits. Uh, so those were, uh, this was a program not in CARES, but in the uh, uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was passed a couple of weeks before the CARES Act, so kind of mid-March or so, that said, look, if you're under 500 employees, we're mandating that you have to offer sick leave um, and or family leave for uh, your employees. And it's like, oh my gosh, you can't, how can you mandate that? It'll bankrupt companies. Well, the reason they're able to mandate that is they're gonna subsidize basically 100% of that through credits, through your payroll tax returns for uh, COVID related um, leave there. So the, that, that is uh, what was set, also set to expire 
um, at the end of this year, um, the mandate did expire, okay? The mandate that required you to offer it did expire, but interestingly, the credit got extended through the first quarter of 2021. So if employers want to continue to offer the uh, sick leave or family medical leave and haven't used up the applicable hours uh, for that credit for those uh, employees, they can still do so. They're just not mandated to. Awesome, thank you. That's really helpful, and this is why um, it truly pays. You know, pun intended, I guess, um, to to have partners like you know Jim and Deborah, um, because there are so many changes, and then there are things that um, you know was just issued, and so um, th there's just no way to to keep on, on top of that yourselves. And um, you know, just really appreciate um, you know Jim and Deborah, you all doing that for us, and and being such great business partners. Okay, let's talk stimulus. Um, so, you know, a few different rounds of this and, and potentially more on the way. Um, but what happens if I didn't receive a check? Uh, am I going to see this on my tax return? Uh, talk us through uh, anything here. Yeah, so the stimulus is kind of confusing, right? And, and um, you know, a lot of people were wondering, well, I, I should have received this earlier in the year and then this got passed again. And was I set up on direct deposit appropriately? And you know, some people that use certain types of tax softwares, there's actually kind of a, a, a trick there, even though you may have been direct deposited, it actually went to the software provider's uh, uh, bank account first before it got to you. So you had been delayed in getting this. So a lot of confusion related to these stimulus checks. But in reality, you know, uh, you, know uh, you need to think of it as kind of a, an advance of a 2020 tax credit, okay? So, you know, th there were those stimulus uh, items that were passed earlier in the year, $1,200 per person, I think in April, and then $500 per dependent. And then just, um, you know, a month or so ago, $600 per person and dependent. Um, so if, if you were entitled to the, uh, I think the phrase is economic impact payment, but you didn't get it, uh, then you'll get what they're calling a recovery rebate credit on your 2020 tax return. So if you're entitled to it, didn't get it, you can still get it on your 2020 return. It otherwise kind of gets reconciled out um, on your 2020 return if you otherwise did get it. Um, if that stimulus check was not the maximum amount um, and your 2020 income is down, then there's a chance you could get the additional amount that you didn't otherwise have up to the max of that credit when you file your 2020 return. So uh, two phases of stimulus there, um, lots of confusion on how I'm going to get it and, and working with the IRS on actually get it finally direct deposited and how it gets reconciled on your 1040. Um, and hopefully everyone did get it. If not, you'll have an opportunity to obtain that when you file your uh, 2020 individual tax return. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, meals and entertainment uh, looked a little bit different uh, th this year with, with COVID, um, but, you know, talk us through uh, what can be allowed as an expenditure, even if um, our entertainment, you know, looked a little bit different this year and, and might not show up um, like it did in previous years. Yeah, there, there's a lot of changes there. And I, I think um, uh, Deborah's got some good comments to share. Uh, on that of, of what changed and what the outlook is for future years too. Sure, this was a little unusual year as far as probably using a meals and entertainment expense. Just a little bit of history. We go back to the to the Tax Reform Act a few years ago, I, I talked about with depreciation and it, it made a little change when you talk about entertainment that uh, entertainment used to fall in this meals and entertainment um, to potentially um, deductible and now entertainment is not deductible there are very few exceptions uh, if you have a party for your employees you know there's you could deduct that but it's a very specific situation generally entertainment is not going to be deductible so if you take a client uh, back in the old world and you would go to a ball game um, you know before the Tax Reform Act, you could deduct 50% of it. Afterwards, you would have to figure out, okay, which part of this was the ball game, which is entertainment, and which part is, you know, food that you purchased while you were there, which could be a meal, and the entertainment part is not deductible now. Um, as far as meals go, meals are, are 
business meals are 50% deductible uh, for 2020. Uh, the change, the big change that happened is uh, in this bill that Jim's referenced a few times that passed in December, uh, they passed something to, to try to encourage uh, businesses to, to start using restaurants again. And you can deduct 100% of business meals that are provided by restaurants in 2021 and 2022, but that does not apply to 2020. Great, thank you. Um, I know um, I, I can't wait to to get back to um, you know business meetings um, over meals or, or what that looks like a little bit differently too. Um, and so appreciate all, all the updates here um, as we you know uh, see what the next few months look like and, and get back to other in-person activities. Um, so home offices, um, which I think has taken on a, a whole new meaning over the past year. Um, if you, you know, didn't have a home office before, you know, chances are um, you do have one now or, or have made something work. So talk us through uh, requirements and what we need to know here. Sure, I'll jump in on this one too. The home office deduction. Uh, first, I think there's, there's a big distinction that you have to make. Um, it it's for a trader business can take a home office deduction. An employee like myself, I'm an employee of BKD, even uh, when I'm working remotely from home and that's my primary place that I'm working, I don't get the home office deduction. It, this is specifically for business owners. So if you have a trader business, you could be allowed to, um, to take the home office deduction. What the way that you would, figure out if you qualify is if you're using part of your home or a separate structure that's that's near your home exclusively and regularly as your principal place of business. Now, um, there are a couple minor exceptions to exclusive and that's if you're storing inventory or you're running a childcare facility out of your home. Uh, since those are exceptions, I think I'll just, I'll just move on from that. But um, just know that you have special rules for inventory and childcare, that's a little more lenient with the with the use um, of different areas of your home. But the activities that you do in this home office, you're saying I exclusively and regularly use this part of my home for business. And that means you're doing administrative or management duties, you're meeting with clients or patients in, in this space that's in your home. Um, if you have more than one trade or business that's using the space, uh, I just want to point out it's important that you you'll have to divvy it up what the space or the uh, how you figure your um, you calculate your deduction. It's going to have to be separated between the businesses allocated properly. Uh, you can't take the full deduction on all of your businesses. Um, there's there's two main ways uh, to calculate your the deduction, and I'm going to suggest, if you can at all possible, use the simplified way to calculate it. Uh, and the simplified way to calculate it is is really easy. Up to 500 square, or excuse me, up to 300 square feet of your home, you can take five dollars off per square feet. That is your home office deduction. So the part of your home that you're using uh, for your business, up to 300 square feet multiply that times $5, and that could be your home office deduction. Um, there's, there's a great benefit to doing that in that you're not having to separate out actual costs uh, related to that part of your, of your home for the home office deduction. And an additional part of those costs could be depreciation expense. The problem with depreciation expense is if you, if you piece off part of your home, and you're using actual expenses to calculate a home office deduction, then that depreciation expense is going to create a basis adjustment for your home. Uh, and that matters when you go to sell it, because as a homeowner that you live in your home, you, you could get an exclusion of the gain from selling your home of up to $250,000 or $500,000 if you're married. And um, if you use it for a home office deduction and take depreciation expense using the actual expenses calculation, then you're going to have to recapture or pick up income rather than excluding all of the gain. So uh, the simplified version is not only easier to calculate, it also simplifies uh, any future endeavors where you may need to sell your home uh, and calculating the gain or exclusion from gain 
on the sale of your home. So the simplified method is the easiest. Uh, there is a limitation. You can only take a deduction up to the amount of uh, income on your business before the home office, before the home office expenses. So if your gross income is higher than your all of your expenses, ex excluding any expenses related to your home, then that's going to be the amount that you can take. Essentially, this deduction is not going to be able to create or add to a loss for your business. Um, if you use the simplified method, then your deduction is going to be limited to whatever your net income is for the business without the home office uh, expenses. Uh, if you don't use a simplified method and you'd rather use the actual method, that's possible, but you would have to capture direct expenses that are related to the specific space that you're using for your home office, and you would need to capture indirect expenses, which would be expenses that are partially allocable to that section. So you pay insurance for your home, you would allocate part of those insurance uh, expenses to that part of your, to, to the home office deduction. You wouldn't take the entire amount because you're only using part of the home. So uh, and then you would need to break off the basis of your home and calculate depreciation on that. Uh, the limitation is very similar to the uh, simplified version in that you're not going to be able to create a loss or extend a loss uh, by using home office expenses. However, if you create, if you use the actual expenses, you could carry forward the the deduction to a future year in case that you had more income in a future year and were able to use that deduction. So uh, using, having a home office deduction is, is, a, is a great option. It needs to be the primary place that you're using it. It's not, if you work four times a week, four days a week, you're working in your office, but then one day you just decide to work from home. I'm not sure you're going to be able to argue that it's your primary and regular place of business. So if you feel like this has been how you've used your home this year, then it's worth looking at uh, taking the home office deduction. And it, for the most, uh, the, the simplest way to do it would be to use a simplified calculation of $5 per square feet. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I know that, you know, if, if some people haven't used that one in the past, um, this may be the year to, to really look into that um, with, with, you know, COVID and, and some of us being at home more, more than normal. Okay, so let's, let's look forward. Um, so, you know, planning for this next year, uh, what are some things that business owners can start preparing for or start doing or, or tracking now? Um, Deborah, I'd like to start with you and then, and then Crystal, I'll turn it over to you to, to talk um, through some tips as well. So, Deborah? You know, when I, when I, when I saw this question, Rachel, um, cash flow is on top of mind of, of, for all of my clients. And, and I know it can feel a little bit overwhelming and maybe tedious to really track what, what you have as far as cash is coming in your business and out of your business. But that to me would be the number one thing that you could do and start doing right now. Um, if you're tracking your cash flow, it's going to help you maintain and, and stay in operations and be more flexible as things change over as the year is coming along. Um, you could also start considering what types of opportunities like R&D credits or work opportunity tax credits if you're, if you're hiring employees over, if you're gonna be hiring some employees this year that, that may be beneficial for your business. Um, if, and that goes back to record keeping. Um, the R&D tax credit uh, is a great opportunity if you're developing processes or products or, um, or new innovative ideas in your business, but you have to capture the expenses related to that activity. And so it all goes back to the, the boring old record keeping and you just want to be organized know what you're doing with your money and where it's going and have a plan. Um, I would highly recommend, if you're not getting the emails from SBDC, sign up for their emails. Um, I, several times over this year, the first place I heard of local grants that were available to businesses was through an SBDC email. 
So I just highly recommend you fo follow them and try to connect with them as much as you can, because you're going to be on the front edge of hearing about what our community is doing for the small businesses in the area. Awesome. Well, that was such a great segue, Deborah. Um, Crystal, I'll turn it over to you to, to talk through some of those resources and um, things to be thinking about for next year. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that, Deborah. And we are 100% on the same page. And, and Deborah speaks at a couple of our different programs because she and I both have the same view on cash flow. So, you know, your business lives and dies by cash flow. Um, many of our business owners, you know, have really struggled with cash flow over this last year, of course. Um, but the overall act of, you know, looking at your previous financial statements, of course, 2020 was a very different year, but it's still good to look back at 2020, um, you know, see what happened, see where your money went, how you were spending it, look back at 2019, even, um, you know, what was different there, and then look forward, you know, what do you hope 2021 looks like? Do you have specific strategies in place to try to expand or new products and services, or maybe you're getting rid of a product or service, or you've pivoted your business um, because of COVID. And so how do all of those decisions then play into you, um, you know, really sitting down and projecting a budget moving forward into 2021? Um, so we are more than happy to have those conversations with you, give you templates that you can use. Um, and we're happy to work alongside you to, to use those templates and build out you know, a cash flow budget um, so that you can start to plan. And then when you're faced with, you know, a difficult decision um, or an obstacle like we were faced with COVID, you already have some ideas of ways that you can try to avert those obstacles and, and different decisions that, that you can make. So like Deborah says, I think she, she really hit it. It's, it's all about planning and that takes time. And we know that all of our small business owners are, are super busy but the more time you put in, the better off um, definitely you'll be. And then definitely looking at, you know, your financial processes and are they allowing you, um, you know, to portray um, the information to your tax provider so that you can have those good conversations like Deborah mentioned with your tax preparer and talk about those options. Because if they can't understand your financial position and you can't communicate that with them, um, it's, it's more difficult to um, do some of that tax planning and really get down to the nitty gritty individually about what could help you. Um, and so, you know, working on either your QuickBooks or whatever software you're using, um, we are more than happy to help people through that process and start it, but then definitely turning that over to, to um, service providers so that they can continue working with you on that. It's so important as you continue to tax plan into the next year and the year after. Awesome. That I think both of you really hit on, um, you know, good tips and, and tools. Um, and really, you know, our takeaway here is you're not alone. Um, you know, so Crystal Consulting Team is, is here to help you, um, you know, BKD, Jim, Deborah, um, here to help you. So, you know, please reach out, talk with us, um, and then we'd love to help. Um, and so, you know, Crystal, can you talk us through some other um, resources or, or other things, um, you know, that SBDC and, and, and you all can, can offer? Yeah, sure. So um, the Missouri Small Business Development Center is here to provide assistance to business owners at every stage of their business. So from feasibility and startup to growth and expansion, and even planning for a successful transition or exit out of your business. Um, you know, when we talk about small businesses, we use the SBA definition, and that means under 500 employees. But to many of us, that would be a, a large um, business. You know, many of our rural communities, if you have a two, 300 um, employee business, you are a large employer um, in that community. And, and so um, just because we call you a small business definitely doesn't um, speak at all to the impact um, that, that you're making as a business owner in, in, in our region and, and in our communities. Um, but specifically through funding from the U.S. Small Business Administration, our team has the amazing privilege to really work alongside business owners throughout the state. Um, but specifically, our center focuses throughout the Southwest region. So we provide assistance to 16 counties um, throughout Southwest Missouri, and we are working with people confidentially, one-on-one um, -on -one through consulting at no additional fee, to both aspiring entrepreneurs, so those that want to start their business, and existing business owners up to that 500 employee mark. 
Um, our one-on-one -on -one assistance supports business owners really in a lot of different ways. We're trying to meet people where they are. Um, I mentioned a couple of times and Rachel has too, we have an amazing team. All of our business consultants either are currently um, or have successfully owned and exited a business. And, and I am really proud of that um, as the director. I think, you know, in order to help small businesses, you really have to understand where they're at and have gone through the same thing, ch uh, ch challenges and successes, um, both of those. And so we work with people to develop financial processes, of course, projections, monitor performance, make informed decisions. A lot of what we do is helping people obtain financing. Um, we work with clients on market research, helping them develop market strat marketing strategies. And then of course, over the last several months, 10 months or so, we've been really focused on um, disaster recovery efforts, really talking people through the different programs, sorting them out, kind of you know, trying to dispel some of the myths about each one of them, some of the confusion, and then they're able to, to work more closely with their service providers and say, okay, in my situation, here it is, and, and how could this work, as kind of Jim talked to about the, the credits and things like that. So um, we also work very closely with our other departments on campus, and so we do a lot of what we call uh, course projects or experiential learning projects, and what this does is it pairs our small business clients with some student courses and those students can then really do an in-depth project for a business. Um, we've done lots of things. We do feasibility studies every semester for people looking to start up a business, but we even do some um, technical writing assistance. If, if somebody has a technical writing project, we do some um, training and development. We do some survey development for both internal um, and customer external purposes. Um, we're doing some management assessments. So really spans, you know, all different types of businesses, all industries, all sizes um, of the different types of projects that we can really dive in um, to for some, some different clients throughout the region. Um, we, we focus a lot on planning, not only in financial management planning, but definitely in strategic planning. Um, so we can really dive in and do some strategic planning engagements with people. As an SBDC client, we are in the Southwest region, of course, part of the e-factory. So you as well get all of those benefits that Rachel mentioned earlier. Um, we partner together to offer a mentorship program. You know, this is where we get expertise really from all different types of um, professionals throughout the region. And we're looking to them to really share that expertise with businesses who need it at the time. Um, so it's not just the people on, on our specific team, but we're helping you really branch out. And so those are always available. We're connecting you with people like Jim and Deborah through office hours, as well as legal office hours with some of our partners through the eFactory. Um, and then Rachel alluded to this earlier as well. We can also provide our clients with a variety of discounts um, to different providers like Intuit and QuickBooks. Um, so right now you get 30... 30 days free and then um, up, up to 40 or 50% off even um, for 12 months on your QuickBooks subscription. This is online only. Um, and there are a number of other different platforms um, that we can offer discounts on as well. So um, always check with us. And, and you know, as we interact with clients, we're also trying to direct them to those different discounts. Um, but we are here for, for small business owners, we're offering a variety of training, of course, like this one. We've done a lot of disaster relief training um, and we'll continue to do all different types of training, both um, at no fee, but some of course for a fee as well, just depending on, on the program. And we're really trying to help small business owners expand their knowledge so that they can be successful. Awesome. That was a great overview. So I hope, um, you know, you all really took away today that um, we're all here to help you. You know, we want you to be successful um, and, you know, please um, don't feel like you're alone uh, here for you. So um, I'll open it up to any questions. If anyone wants to pop anything into the chat that we didn't cover today, um, have a few minutes that, that we can ask those or, you know, Jim, Deborah, Crystal, anything that we didn't touch on that you thought of that uh, we want to share. Um, I'll give everybody a minute to fill in any questions or, or answer any um, kind of last parting words before we let you go and get back to your day. Rachel, as we wait for questions, I, I want to touch on a point I made earlier in the, the presentation 
uh, regarding employee retention credits and how that got expanded and extended into 2021. Um, so we talked about how in 2020, it's up to $10,000 of wages. Half of that or 50% of that is eligible for credit. Um, for 2021, it's $10,000 of wages per quarter. So first quarter, up to $10,000 of wages are eligible and it's 70% of that is eligible for a retention credit. Uh, then that starts back over in second quarter. You can, uh, if you pay that same employee another $10,000, up to 70% can be a credit there. And, and uh, another shift they made in expanding the, that program was, uh, I referenced kind of this 100 employee baseline um, that, you know, basically if, if you employed them um, up to 100 employees, including your affiliates, you, you get that credit assuming you meet the reduction in, in business uh, revenues or uh, partial or full shutdown from a governing authority. So um, that that was a big deal and will be a huge difference because that, that got expanded to 500 employees. So a lot of these, Crystal kind of touched on, you may not feel like you're a small business, maybe you're a large employer in your community, 300, 400 employees. That's real big dollars when you start doing the math there. And it can be a massive cash flow uh, injection really to the company because it's a refundable credit, okay? It's not just reducing your payroll taxes. It can refund those back to the organization. So really strong cash injection there. Um, now, there's always a little curveballs and complications. Uh, the big one I just wanna point out is even though it can be used with PPP, uh, concurrently, both PPP1 and PPP2, um, you can't count the same wages for each program, okay? So wages with, that we count for the retention credit, those can't be counted towards forgiveness purposes for PPP1 or PPP2. So you, you really need to start analyzing your payroll and metrics and, and what bucket you wanna put those in and, and uh, to make sure you take advantage of the most opportunity there. Awesome. That's a great tip. Um, and, and this is why you, you have um, friends like Jim, Deborah, and Crystal on speed dial, right? So um, they can help you figure out what's, what's best for your, your business. Um, well, I didn't see any questions come in. And I guess, you know, maybe that's because we, we did have the all-star team here today and um, shared a lot of great information. And, you know, if you all um, leave today and think of something that, that you wish you would have asked, um, you know, please reach out, use this as a resource and, and want to make sure we get those questions answered. So um, thanks again for joining us. Um, you know, look to your inbox for, uh, you know, a recording of this and, and kind of a recap and, and ways that we can continue to help you and um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you so much.